Mark 1. Conversations at the speed of sound. off from Sydney Harbour for distant oceans and the British Isles as final destination. Launching the Australia England Airmail by Qantas Empire Airways. Sea craft and aircraft too. Crossing the world by the Skyway with the seaways below. Hello and welcome to this episode of Mac One, the podcast of the Queensland Air Museum Caloundra. My name is Gary Hills. I am a QAM volunteer, I'm happy to say, and I am your host for this episode, looking at a fascinating little snapshot of Australian aviation history about the Empire flying boats. Now, what you just heard was a snippet from a British movie tone newsreel from 1938 describing the Empire uh, flying boat service between the UK and Sydney. And I have another little clip that we might as well play right now also. This one is from British Pathé, and it's about the same topic and the same year, 1938. Into the evening sun, the Empire flying boat takes off on the first experimental air service from Sydney, New South Wales to Southampton, the world's longest air route in 85 flying hours. And the steamships take six weeks. The topic today is, as you now know, the Empire Flying Boats, Qantas Airways, Qantas Empire Airways, as it was named at the time, uh, operated six of these uh, Empire Flying Boats between 1938 and the outbreak of war in 1939, at which time, of course, the situation grew very complicated, particularly for commercial travel. Sometimes aircraft had to be commandeered by the Air Force, At other times, they were used by government for various purposes. And, of course, civil aviation was completely disrupted. But in that period of time, that that narrow window of time, 1938, 1939, 40, 41, the Empire flying boats were in operation. And you're about to hear everything you could possibly need to know about the short Empire flying boats from a man who knows, in my opinion, probably as much, if not more, than anyone else in the world. His name is Paul Sheehan, and he's just finished a monumental research project culminating in a 550-page definitive study of the Empire Flying Boats. That's all it's about, folks, is the Empire Flying Boats. Hundreds of photographs, meticulously researched, about to be published, and I'm looking forward to the day when I can purchase a copy. At this stage, the working title is By Empire to the Antipodes, but Paul will tell you all about that. Now, I spoke with Paul, and because the topic was so interesting, we went for a little longer than I would like to normally uh, go for a, a podcast episode, so I've broken it into two episodes. Today you're going to hear for roughly half an hour or so, Paul will talk about the history of flying boats, he will talk about shorts uh, as a, a an aviation company, he will talk about the Empire flying boats and their history in general as a backdrop. And then next week for, uh, again, about 30 minutes or so, you'll hear Paul talk about the six Qantas aircraft, what they did, what became of them. And that will complete this little study, this little look at the short Empire flying boats. So Paul joined me uh, over the internet from his home in Melbourne, and we recorded this interview just recently. So here is part one of my conversation with Paul Sheehan. G'day, Paul. Hi, Gary. How are you? Nice to meet you. Great. Thank you. Yes. And I've been so looking forward to this. Now, for our audience, why don't you quickly introduce yourself, uh, where you're from and what's your background? Sure. Um, My name's Paul Sheehan. I'm a New Zealander by birth and uh, I lived in New Zealand until 20 years ago when I moved to Australia. So my background is that uh, I spent most of my um, professional life in uh, travel agencies and airlines, Uh, seven years as a travel agent in New Zealand, and I had this burning ambition to join an airline, which I did in 1980, and I flew for 25 years with Air New Zealand as cabin crew, 
and during that time, I did a lot of in-flight training of new cabin crew and um, special um, training for business class and things like that. Okay. Uh, in in uh, year 2004, I moved to Australia. Uh, I My partner was um, finding it very difficult for work in New Zealand, and so we decided we'd come here to make a... And, and new um, uh, opportunities. And so um, I commuted for three years because AMSET had recently collapsed and everybody blamed Air New Zealand for it and nobody wanted to know somebody from Air New Zealand when yeah, I applied for a job. Yes. So I commuted for three years. But anyway, uh, in 2004, uh, I moved here permanently and um, I became the manager of the domestic cabin crew for Jetstar when they set up. And uh, I stayed there in that position for nearly eight years. And in the last year that I was there, I carried out some um, special work for them. They were setting up Jetstar in Japan, had already set up in um, Vietnam, Vietnam and in Singapore. Uh, we had a base in Bangkok, and so I went around all of those bases recruiting cabin crew, uh, also in New Zealand and throughout Australia. For a whole year, I was pretty much on the road. Okay. Uh, a big reshuffle came in 2012, and my job went, so um, I went too. <laughs> and uh, I rejoined Air New Zealand in a way. I worked for Donata at Melbourne Airport, but I was um, working in the Air New Zealand lounge as lounge host for three years. So, so there is aviation customer service flowing through your veins uh, yes, after yes. all of those years. And this was to differentiate you, by the way, Paul, for our listeners from the Paul Sheehan, who is a Fairfax journalist in Australia, Correct. Uh, just to make and sure. Paul that... Sheehan, who was the cricketer. <laughs> Okay, right. So we've cl cleared all that up. Um, now, you've spent quite some time producing uh, a book, over 500 yes. pages, about yes. what? It is completely about the operational movements record of the Empire flying boats. I I think it's it's uh, rather nice that we should be talking on this particular at this particular time because in uh, April 1938, 85 years ago, on the 2nd of April, Qantas's first S-23 was delivered to Brisbane. So wow. I thought it was very apt that we were talking about this today. That's amazing. So we're going back 85 years to the beginning of the Qantas Empire flying boat story, which is perfect. And we do Great. want to focus in on that in our conversation. But But before we get there, let's talk about your book. Okay, now yes. you you must be you probably won't like me saying this, but you have just recently completed this work, and it is the definitive study, you know, worldwide on this topic on the Empire flying boats. Is that right? I believe so. The, I know of no other book that goes into the depth and and history of these aircraft. There were mm. forty two of them built. So my book contains uh, a history on each one and what happened to each of the aircraft. And uh, it is followed by a, an appendix giving the full operational movements record of each of those aircraft. Flight so, numbers, where they went, dates, the whole lot. This makes you, I suppose, the world's leading authority on this topic. I, I wouldn't like to claim that. No, but I, I know I you don't wouldn't, know but I'm sure it's true. It. <laughs> I'll say it for you, uh, Paul, because it sounds to me like that's that's not an un, that's not a long bow to draw. So we we um, have you have you published this yet? Are we able to obtain a copy of this yet? Not not yet. It's it's currently with a very large London publisher. Uh, I have until June to get my my. Uh, complete script to them well congratulations that is such a, a milestone and you know good luck with that we hope we can see it on the bookshelves very soon full of photographs of empire flying boats full of great information including as you say operational histories and so on do you have a title yet that we could look out for the title that i have chosen is by empire to the antipodes okay with antipodes being the ends of the earth yes so, indeed which is really what 
Exactly, Australia yeah. and New Zealand, obviously, with Teal, with the ta- yeah. Tasman um, uh, airlines as well. We we probably won't cover the, the the New Zealand aspect of it at this point because we've got so much to talk no. about with Qantas. But, yes, yeah, so congratulations on that. I will look forward to seeing that. From Empire to the Antipodes at this point is the working title. Uh, by Paul Sheehan, and uh, well, let's hope it's available sometime in the next months. Can you first of all give us a, a quick introduction to the Short Brothers and to to their story, because that's as a backdrop to talking about the Empire yes. Flying Boat. Yes, sure. So um, Short Brothers are the the oldest uh, manufacturer of aircraft still in operation in the world. They started off um, with a factory on the banks of the River Medway in Rochester in Kent uh, around about 1924. And uh, they built a number of different flying boats um, for Imperial Airways, who had set up in 1924. Uh, Also, um, military flying boats and things like that. They have been quite successful with those. The you know, um, Imperial Airways became BOAC and then British Airways. Airways. Mm-hmm. Right, in 1940, beginning mm-hmm. of 1940. Um, uh, the the pr- big problem was that the Imperial Airways were hell-bent on getting a, a fast airmail service mm-hmm. uh, out into the into the countries of the British Empire. Mm-hmm. And uh, in the days of, uh, before the flying boat started, it was six, seven, eight weeks uh, for a ship to come from England out to Australia, for example. And the mail, therefore, just didn't come quickly. Yeah. They set about designing the perfect boat. And of course, in those days, there was there was no um, not a, a number of airports throughout the world uh, that could take large aeroplanes, and large aeroplanes hadn't even been built. So mm. it, it was catch twenty two really. So they decided that to build a suitable flying boat to do this operation, it only it only meant building the flying boat, having a. a, a, a certain depth of water, the the minimum was nine feet of water underneath them, and uh, a mooring, and they were in business, Mm. and they could get underway. The big initial problem with the Empire flying boat was it only carried 652 gallons of petrol in two tanks, a total of 652. So it only had a range of something like 700 miles, 680 to 720 miles. So, of course, to bring an aircraft out to Sydney, it meant a lot of refuelling stops. In fact, 33 all up. (laughs) And uh, the initial flights took 12 days to come out from uh, England to Sydney. Mm. And they later managed to reduce that down to about nine and a half days. So so before we go any further, tell us us the difference between a flying boat and a seaplane. Okay, a flying boat lands on its fuselage and the wings are supported by floats on each side. A seaplane lands on floats that are built below the uh, level of the fuselage. Okay, so the the boat, the flying boat itself sits in the water on its fuselage. Now, I believe one of the Short brothers said we don't build aircraft that land on the sea, we build ships that fly in the air, something like that. Is that right? Something like that, yes, and and that was very true. Yeah. They 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 wanted to make these very comfortable for passengers. Now this was uh, the Empire was uh, the, as they designed it was a pretty big airplane. It was it was uh, eighty eight feet long and it, it had a wingspan of one hundred and fourteen feet with four um, uh, engines on it, and they initially thought of building it as they had built their earlier flying boats, and that is with uh, the wing sitting on a hump on top of the fuselage. And the reason that they initially did that was to make sure that there was plenty of space between the bottom of the turning propeller and the water. So they wanted to lift it as high as possible. And then Arthur Gouge, who was given the the job of designing the Empire boat, 
had had took a look at it and thought, why don't we why don't we build the fuselage up to the wing, right up to the wing? And by doing that, it gave them the opportunity to have mm-hmm. two decks on the, on, on the flying boat. Now, as it was initially designed, it had four passenger cabins. Starting at the back, there was a, the rear cabin was for six passengers. The middle cabin was for eight passengers. The uh, little cabin towards the front was for three passengers. And then there was the very front cabin, which took seven. So a total of 24 passengers. However, that didn't last long because the demand for mail, once the aircraft started, was way greater than the demand for passengers, especially once the wartime came around. And so the front cabin got converted to a mail carrying cabin and reduced down to 17 passengers. Mm -hmm. Some airlines even took the two single seats in the biggest cabin out and made them operating with 15 passengers. But in the event that they had an extra couple of passengers, they could quickly install those two seats back in. And I believe they, part of the, the selling point for commercial travel was that these were luxurious. These were like ocean liners in the air. They absolutely were. They were catered by the, the very best that they could get. If, For example, even on the, the, the um, experimental flights they did to New York, they were... Uh, catered by Longchamp Restaurant, which is still a very famous restaurant in in uh, New York. So the standard was extremely high, very high. Are you organising a group outing for your club? Maybe a reunion or even a birthday party. Perhaps you're planning an evening event and you're looking for a unique venue. At the Queensland Air Museum, we welcome inquiries from groups to visit the museum between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. and can offer a highly enjoyable experience in aviation history. Tours are conducted by our experienced volunteer guides. Bring your lunch and make a day of it. Hangar 2 at the museum is a unique and welcoming space. 3,000 square metres of sealed floor space undercover but open on two sides, allowing cooling breezes and ambient light. Tables and chairs located under the wings of our historic aircraft. After hours, the venue can accommodate up to 200 people with chairs only, or up to 120 people seated at tables. And we have played host to hangar dances, birthday parties, and even opera nights in the hangar. Imagine performing on stage with the oldest DC-3 in Australia as your backdrop. Contact us under bookings on the Queensland Air Museum website or email our Tours and Events Manager at tours at qldair.museum or phone us with your inquiry. The Queensland Air Museum Caloundra, an amazing, welcoming and unique venue for your tour or event. They experimented for a little while putting bunks in a couple of the cabins. Um, but the, the problem w- with that was the, the airplane flexed a little in flight and they had great trouble every time they went to try and install the the um, bedding, the, the beds into the flight at night time, they had terrible trouble getting them to attach to the attach points on the walls and things like that. So they, I believe they, really they flew in the daytime only, though, didn't they? Did they fly at night? Um, mostly they flew it in daytime, but there was the odd occasion when they did have to, it got delayed or things like that, and they mm. would still continue on. And they would call for flares to be laid um, for them to uh, land. Well, we don't say land; we say a light, a, a flying boat alights. Okay, it doesn't it doesn't land? <laughs> okay, yes, yeah. that's a good distinction. Now they didn't have; they obviously were not pressurized. So, what was their operational ceiling and and their airspeed and those kinds of things? Okay, the we'll start with the airspeed. It was around about one hundred and sixty-five miles per hour. 
Uh, the fastest I ever heard that they got one up to was at 193 miles an hour, and that was in a dive during a test flight. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, about 165, uh, yeah. range around 700-odd miles, and uh, 33 stops to Sydney, you know, was a... So they're flying at, what, four or 5,000 feet? Uh, yes, not much more. So sometimes lower, sometimes a little bit higher. The, on the odd occasion, they did go to 10,000 feet, depending on um, on the weather. Mm. Uh, that was an important aspect of, of how high they went. And, of course, the, the lack of oxygen after 10,000 yes. feet as well. Of course. So, I mean, the weather is the first thing that comes to mind. The flying conditions coming all the way across the world you know, yes. at that limited altitude, uh, they must have contended with all kinds of dramas with weather. Oh, they, they had incredible problems. The biggest problem was if they if they had to, at short notice, um, uh, beach one of the aircraft, because to get them onto dry land, special um, trolleys had to be fitted mm. to the sides of the aircraft with the wheels so that they could drag them out of the water and of course initially they weren't available at every place they went so uh, that created some problems in its own right and they soon got those wheels available to every port yeah uh, i'm just thinking the images i've seen the photographs i've seen you, you describe these luxury cabins and the service i mean there was only one class wasn't there it was all first class i guess all first class. Yeah. yeah and it, it just looks so you know uh, uh, luxurious and uh, comfortable but you know, aircraft flying during those days were not comfortable many times because they couldn't get above the weather. They would have had great views of the uh, of the terrain yes. and the, the ocean, but they must have contended with, uh, you know, thunderstorms and all of the kinds of things that they would have had to deal with. They sure did. Um, the, the views were part of the package, if you mm. like. They, they really pushed that, that you could see clearly. The main cabin had a leaning rail along the port side uh, of the fuselage in the, in, in the cabin. And there were four very large windows, almost what you would call picture windows for, a, for a, um, an aircraft. And people would stand there and they had the leaning bar to hold on to if it got a little bit bumpy or, but just to lean, lean there and look out over things like the, um, the Sphinx and the mm. pyramids and Egypt and the the coastline of Baluchistan on the way into Karachi, which is magnificent mountains and things like that. And people could just stand there and watch it all as the world went by. I mean, it's very attractive as a concept, isn't it? And then each night they would stay in a luxury hotel, I suppose. Yes, the, and the hotel and meals were all part of the deal, that part of the fair. Uh, the fares were very expensive, around three hundred pounds to come uh, one way out to to uh, Australia. It was very expensive. It was, and that for that reason, it was more often used by government and big businesses and things like that. There were very few people who were doing le leisure travel. And of course, once 1939 came around and, and the, the, they'd only been operating for a year out to Australia when war broke out. And of course, that stopped all personal travel anyway. Nobody sure. wanted to travel. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you mentioned the beaching challenge. Um, in your researches, there must be many stories of these rich uh, passengers being transported to very exotic and, um, you know, perhaps primitive locations. Were there, you know, are there, are there adventure stories there to tell? It sounds like Jules Verne, you know, to me. <laughs> well, well, there, there were a lot of, a lot of um, uh, famous people like the Duke of Kent was, for example, was invited to a, um, a, a big party out in, Lisbon in Portugal, and they the government chartered one of the aircraft and flew him out there. Especially the crew stayed with them out there for two days, and then brought him back again. But in the during the war years, the aircraft all came initially under the um, jurisdiction of 
government agencies such as the the uh, Air Transport Command and things like that, and they had the right to commandeer flying boats at any place, mm -hmm. at any time, and often for secret missions that they needed to do. Yeah. And that did happen on quite a number of occasions. When, when war happened, of course, the first thing that happened was in, on the 10th of June 1940, the Mediterranean was closed off to um, civil air routes when Italy entered the, the war. So at that stage, then, there were aircraft that were um, on the western side of Italy and there were others that were on the eastern side of Italy. And so what happened was because the Qantas and Imperial or BOAC fleets were treated, in fact, as a common fleet, even though six were registered here and 31, I think, were registered in the UK, they, they could operate the whole network. And so the Qantas pilots operated as far as Singapore and the BOAC pilots operated on to London and vice versa coming back. So when the Mediterranean closed, those Australian aircraft that were stuck on that side were then moved to a new um, BOAC base at Durban in South Africa. The, 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 the English were very clever over what happened with the, the BOAC fleet because they had made these um, arrangements in advance that if war went ahead, they would move everything to South Africa, virtually everything, and operate what they nicknamed the horseshoe route, which came from Durban up through the middle of Africa to Cairo and then across the east and down to Sydney and back again. Oh. And so they also operated a new route from Cairo to Lagos, which connected with a couple that were a couple of aircraft they kept in the UK that then operated through Lagos, Freetown, Bathurst, and up to Lisbon to Foynes and over to Paul. My goodness. So they, they were still able to operate those, but it was it was off one onto another sort of thing, you know, yeah, to get people yes. from like a like a to like a relay. So and, and what they're doing, of course, during the war is transporting mail and communications and any government officials or military officials and so on. That's right. Then, of course, the next problem came when when uh, the Japanese forces invaded Singapore between the 8th and 15th of February of 1942, and that then cut off all flights into Australia. And so the aircraft that were left here, and there was only about five of them at that stage, the ones that were here, some Australian, some British, but all all in fact, chartered, not lent or anything. They were chartered to the R RAAF and um, they they were put into um, camouflage and everything. So, some of them were fitted with bomb racks and um, guns on the top of the fuselages. You know, they could come up through, a, through an opening in the top. And so th those operated for the RAAF then in the end, only one survived that whole operation, and that was Coriolanus, and it went on to become the most used flying boat of, uh, of the whole fleet. It completed over 15,000-something uh, hours, where most of them were like, Eight, ten, twelve thousand hours, and Coriolanus went on. In the end, operating Qantas's network of um, uh, after the war up through Brisbane, Newmere, and over to Suva, and so on. Now, the Empire Flying Boat had uh, competitors. There were other flying boats out there at the time. Short weren't the only company that were producing them. How did it no. rank? How did it perform alongside other flying boats around the world? Look, it, perform, it performed pretty well. Its its big problem was its range, and the 
Americans by 19... 1940 had built the Boeing 314, which was a very large flying boat. BOAC uh, managed to get hold of three of those from Pan American, and they operated those almost exclusively in the um, Atlantic area. They didn't go anywhere else. They went in the in the summertime through Foynes to Botwood in Newfoundland and on to uh, Baltimore or what or New York. Mm-hmm. In, the, in the northern winter, they operated down to Lisbon and on to um, Lagos in Nigeria. But on the way back, they would then go from Bathurst across to Natal or Belém in north, northern Brazil, then to Trinidad, to uh, Bermuda, and then to New York or Barbados. So that's how they kind of kept the the airways moving. You know, it was mm. it was difficult. There was war on, and the the problems with weather in the North Atlantic, of course, in the winter time were unforgiving. You yeah. know, they they just mm. they just couldn't. They 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 fought the problems of ice and and sea ice and fog and things like that. It was very, very difficult. Mm. Shaw uh, Brothers also designed a, a, a larger version called yeah. the G-Class. They only built three of them, and their initial idea was that those three would operate the North Atlantic and two of the S-30s, which were a subsequent development of the original empires. They were they were much the same. Same Everything about them was the same, except they were stronger. They were built much stronger. They had a big issue with early S-23s where the planing hull, underneath the planing hull, uh, caused them a lot of grief. They, they lost about nine aircraft in the first 18 months through either... Um, being hit by a wave or something, and and the aircraft would lift and then drop right onto, and it took the whole bottom off the the flying boats on nine occasions. Oh, no. And you know, it was terrible yes. time for them. Yes, it's an engineering challenge, isn't it? It's a physics challenge getting these things onto the water and off the water. It's not, it's not straightforward. It's now, I, I know that uh, so RAAF number 10 squadron were in England uh, with Sunderland flying boats when war broke out in 1939. And I believe they were the first RAAF squadron to actually encounter uh, active duty in the war. And then they stayed there for the entire duration of the war. Right. So the Sunderland was a short production as well wasn't it it was actually a development of the empire flying boat it was it 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 became the military version if if you like of the empire flying boat and of course they had they had learned such a lot from the very early days of of testing and and everything to do with the empires that they managed to perfect a lot of the things that were were going wrong in the civil field and put those things into the Sunderland. Now, it went on to be a very successful aeroplane with, I think, something like 740 of them built. And they had a number of factories around Britain that that, um, assembled and and developed military stuff for them, you know, fitting them with with, um, guns and all sorts of stuff. Mm. So Mm. they were very successful. So that was maritime patrol and anti-submarine and search and rescue and so on, yes. So that's it for this episode, part one of Paul Sheehan talking about the Empire Flying Boats. Next week you'll hear about Qantas and uh, the six uh, Empire Flying Boats that were operated by Qantas. So thank you to Paul Sheehan for taking the time out to talk with us. As I say, if not the world's leading expert, he's got to be up there somewhere. And uh, it was great to hear from him. Next week, you'll hear about Qantas and uh, the six uh, Empire flying boats that were operated by Qantas. What happened to them? What became of them? And it's a sad tale, in a way. It's a very sad ending to a, a most interesting part of aviation history. There are no Empire flying boats left, is the short version. That's a spoiler.
But uh, what we will know after you've heard next week's episode is uh, what happened to them, what was their service record and what became of them. Thank you for listening today. Don't forget at the Queensland Air Museum we are open every day except Christmas Day and Easter Friday from 10am to 4pm and we would love for you to come in and visit us. We'd love to meet you. Come in and see us soon. Bye for now.